Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by T.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, The Surreal Deal, Aimé and Suzanne Césaire. My negritude is not a stone, its deafness hurled against the clamor of the day. My negritude is not a leucoma of dead liquid over the earth's dead eye. My negritude is neither tower nor cathedral. It takes root in the red flesh of the soil. It takes root in the ardent flesh of the sky. It breaks through opaque prostration with its upright patience. These mysterious but evocative lines are among the most celebrated parts of Aimé Césaire's long poem, Notebook of a Return to My Native Land, which was first published in 1939, but then subsequently revised, until the definitive edition was published in 1956. That was just one of a number of remarkable contributions by Césaire to Africana art and thought in 1956. In September of that year, he attended the first Congress of Black Writers and Artists and presented a paper called Culture and Colonization, one of the boldest statements ever made on the relationship between, you guessed it, culture and colonization. The next month, he gave up his membership within the French Communist Party, explaining his reasons for doing so in an open letter to the party's national secretary, Maurice Thorez. This letter, too, is a bold statement and a fascinating reflection on race, culture, and socialist politics. Given the combination of the poem's publication, his noteworthy intervention at the conference, and his momentous decision concerning his political affiliation, 1956 perfectly encapsulates the breadth, depth, and significance of Césaire's interests and activities. We will not, however, begin this episode's discussion of Césaire's contributions in the 1950s. Instead, we will return once more to the 1930s, when he invented the word négritude and used it for the first time in the student journal L'Étudiant Noir. We have already emphasized in our last two episodes his collaboration at this time with Leopold Sédar Senghor and Léon Gontran Damas, but there is someone else with whom he associated in those days and whom we wish to bring to the forefront. Her name, when they met, was Suzanne Rossi, and she, like Césaire, was a Martinican student in Paris. Indeed, like him, she had managed to get through the highly competitive examination process necessary to secure a spot as a student at the École Normale Supérieure, which is where they met. She is credited in a number of sources with being a contributor to L'Étudiant Noir, though Tracy Sharpley Whiting's book, Negritude Women, denies this. But remember that several issues of this journal have gone missing. If we could just manage to find the other three or four issues published before the journal folded, sometime in 1935 or 1936, there's every reason to think that we would gain access to Suzanne Rossi's earliest published writings. Césaire and Rossi fell in love, and in July of 1937 became Césaire and Césaire. They left Paris in 1939 to teach in Martinique at the Lycée Cholcher, the most important school not only on the island, but in all of the French Caribbean. It was named after Victor Cholcher, the French abolitionist who was a key figure in the achievement of the abolition of slavery in the French colonies in 1848. Aimé, as we will refer to him now that we are in the period where both he and Suzanne carry the last name Césaire, viewed Cholcher as among the most remarkable figures in all of French history. He wrote multiple tributes explaining why Cholcher should be seen as a political genius whose legacy must be carried forward. The Lycée Cholcher was the same high school where he first met Damas, and the two of them would not be the last of its famous graduates. During the time that the Césaires were teaching there, two of the students who came through its halls and experienced the influence of the Césaires were Franz Fanon and Édouard Glissant, who would also become important voices in 20th century Africana philosophy. The war years during which the Césaires taught at their school were also among the most philosophically productive years for this brilliant married couple. Along with a few other collaborators, the Césaires created and edited a literary journal called Tropique, meaning tropics, which ran from 1941 to 1945. In this journal, we find some of Aimé's most philosophically interesting writing, as well as all of the writing by Suzanne to which we still have access. They used the journal as a venue to critically reflect on art and identity, with one of the most important themes of their work being the productive power of surrealism. If you're familiar with this artistic movement, you may already have recognized its manifestation 
in the challenging uses of metaphor and imagery in the lines of poetry with which we began this episode. The movement was officially launched in 1924, when the French poet André Breton published his Surrealist Manifesto. Breton and other Surrealists were greatly inspired by the work of Sigmund Freud, particularly his thoughts on how dreams offer access to the unconscious mind. Surrealist writers experimented with techniques like automatic writing, which involves attempting to write without consciously choosing one's words, thus allowing the unconscious mind to express itself. This naturally results in forms of writing that do not conform to standard expectations, generating surprising associations and curious juxtapositions. Surrealists sought to use these techniques to get beyond reality as we know it through the conscious use of reason to a superior reality, a sur-reality, accessible through the unconstrained activity of the mind. We have mentioned Surrealism in connection with Mehretude before, when we noted that the Martinican student journal Légitime Défense, which came before L'Étudiant Roi, dedicated itself to both communism and Surrealism. According to Senghor, L'Étudiant Roi positioned itself in opposition to Légitime Défense, rejecting and reversing the earlier journal's privileging of politics over culture. Aimé Césaire's piece on racial consciousness and revolution in the third issue of L'Étudiant Noir exemplifies Senghor's point with its claim that only by embracing their negritude will Black people succeed in achieving real revolution rather than superficial change. There is some irony, then, that Aimé would come to be acclaimed as among the greatest Surrealist poets, in addition to being, for a number of years, a member of the French Communist Party, thus combining in his own life the two major commitments of the Légitime Défense Collective. This looks like Aimé was not just exploring his mind, but also changing it. Indeed, there is something to be said for seeing his views as dynamic and shifting over time, perhaps more than he himself ever realized. Yet we might also see him as aiming only a partial critique at the approach of Légitime Défense in the 1930s. One side of this is that in editing Tropique, he and Suzanne collaborated closely with René Ménil, who had been a member of the Légitime Défense Collective. Menil is well worth our attention, since his area of study while at the Sorbonne in Paris and the subject he taught at the Lycée Cholchet, once back in Martinique, was philosophy. He is therefore recognizable as a professional philosopher, similar to the North American thinkers we considered in episode 80. One of Menil's most interesting contributions to Tropique was his essay entitled Birth of Our Art, which appeared in the journal's first issue. He argues that we misunderstand culture when we think of it as something that can be chosen, and then go about trying to select the most attractive one. Instead, we should recognize culture as a living set of determined conditions, land, race, economic forms, etc., allowing us to see that there is no detaching ourselves from our culture. When we strive to imitate another culture, even that is yet another way of being ourselves, of actualizing our possibilities. But in this case, one risks engaging in a sort of childish game. To be enchanted by the ideas of another culture is not the same thing as possessing that culture as its own inhabitants do. Once Menil has identified us as inseparable from our cultures in this way, he argues somewhat surprisingly that we express this in art by embracing our difference as individuals. The artist's embrace of individuality is not a form of isolation from society, but rather the best means to effective communication. Menil offers this intriguing metaphor, the tree has access to the world not through the external but through its inner being, through its roots. By the essay's end, he critically addresses the case of poetry from Martinique and elsewhere in the French Caribbean, naming Damas in a footnote as an exception to the general lack of genuine individual expression in this literature. He also gives credit to Aimé at the end of a different essay in another issue called The Situation of Poetry in the Caribbean, pointing back toward Légitime Défense as an original conception of what came to fruition in Aimé's work through the power of Surrealist method. Suzanne praises the power of Surrealism in more than one of her contributions to Tropique. Her article, André Breton, Poet, pays tribute to the founder of Surrealism, exalting him as the most authentic French poet of our time. This appeared in the second issue of the journal, published in July of 1941, by which time the Césaires had already had the pleasure of meeting Breton in Martinique. Earlier that year, having left France to go to the United States, Breton and his family were forced to stop and stay a while in Martinique. 
while buying a ribbon for his daughter, Breton happened to find the first issue of Tropique, published that same month of April. The shopkeeper turned out to be a sister of Menil, who was thus able to connect Breton to the journal's founders. The time they spent together left an impression on all who were involved, with Breton being especially thankful to Aimé for giving him a copy of Notebook of a Return to My Native Land. He went on to write an essay entitled A Great Black Poet, in which he acclaims Aimé's poem, which remained little known at that point, as nothing less than the greatest lyrical monument of our time. The essay was published in Tropique and later translated into English. It served as the preface for the first English language edition of the poem in 1947. Suzanne's article in Tropique, entitled 1943, Surrealism and Us, continues the theme of affectionate appreciation as it begins with a few lines from Aimé's poem Batouk. How romantic to start an essay with a quotation from your significant other. But this is not quite the Valentine's Day card it may seem, since the us in the title is not a reference to the Césaires as a couple, but to the whole people of Martinique. Suzanne describes surrealism as a revolutionary activity, the only one that can liberate humankind by revealing to it the unconscious, one of the activities that will aid in liberating people by illuminating the blind myths that have led them to this point. She describes her island with its history of slavery and its struggles at that present time under the rule of Vichy France as a society corrupt from its origins through crime, reliant for the present on injustice and hypocrisy, fearful of its future because of its guilty conscience. The transformation of that situation requires devotion to freedom, precisely of the sort Suzanne sees as inherent in Surrealism. Yet, Surrealism is not the only influence on Nehretude thought that Suzanne lauds in the pages of Tropique. In the very first issue, she took as her topic, Leo Frobenius and the Problem of Civilizations. Leo Frobenius was a German anthropologist whose views are not treated today as influential upon the field. As Gregson Davis writes in his book on Aimé, Frobenius's reception among researchers in the discipline of anthropology was from the start deeply skeptical of his sweeping generalizations surrounding such vague concepts as Kultur. Today, his theories are prone to strike both specialists and non-specialists alike as fanciful and so mystical as to be non-falsifiable. Still, a book of his on the history of African civilizations was published in French translation at just the right time to be read by the people in and around the L'Etudiant Noir group. The anti-Eurocentric aspects of his praise for African civilizations inspired them. Senghor told of how he and Aimé read and reread some parts of it until they had it memorized. Reading this and other essays by Suzanne, one is struck by her affection for something else, curious generalizations. In The Malaise of Civilization from the April 1942 issue, she raises the question, what is the Martinican fundamentally? Her answer is a plant human. In saying this, she draws on a distinction that Frobenius makes between Ethiopian and Hamitic civilizations, two supposed types of people on the African continent. The Ethiopian type is tied to the plant, to the vegetative cycle, as Suzanne explains in her article on Frobenius. The Hamitic type, on the other hand, is tied to the animal, to the conquest of the right to live through violent struggle and conquest. Thus, in The Malaise of Civilization, she argues that, like the plant, the Martinican abandons himself to the rhythm of universal life. It is misleading to call the Martinican lazy, better to say he vegetates. Whether one is troubled or tickled by this, the fact is that Suzanne exemplifies here an important aspect of Nehretude thinking, the claim that black people are in touch with the natural rhythms of things. It is, however, no less typical of Nehretude when she clarifies at the article's end that resisting assimilation will not mean being purely African. It is not at all about a backwards return, a resurrection of an African past that we have learned to know and respect. On the contrary, it is about the mobilization of every living strength brought together upon this earth, where race is the result of the most unremitting intermixing. It is about becoming conscious of the incredible store of varied energies until now locked up within us. As mentioned before, we have no writing of Suzanne's after 1945, when the last issue of Tropique appeared. Perhaps the six children she and Aimé had kept her too busy. She died too young of brain cancer at the age of 51 in 1966, at which point she had been separated from Aimé for three years, a decision that she made. 
We cannot help mentioning before turning to focus on Aimé that Suzanne is thought to be the member of the editorial collective who drafted the response to Lieutenant Bale, chief of the Information Service, when he sent a letter announcing his decision not to allow publication of the journal's next issue in May of 1943, objecting to its revolutionary, racial, and sectarian character. The letter in response showed no sign of bowing to this repressive force. Racists, yes. Racism like that of Toussaint Louverture, Claude McKay, and Langston Hughes, against the racism like that of Hitler. Now let us turn from Suzanne to Aimé, beginning another Césarean section, if you will, but remain in the era of Tropique. What might be Aimé's most self-consciously philosophical work was published in the journal. Entitled Poetry and Knowledge, he wrote it for an international philosophy conference held in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, in September of 1944. It begins with the statement, Poetic knowledge is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. In what follows, Aimé characterizes scientific knowledge in a manner similar to Senghor's characterization of analytical reason. It enumerates, measures, classifies, and kills. And yet for all its power, it is, according to Aimé, an impoverished and undernourished form of knowledge. There is something dissatisfying in the impersonal nature of scientific knowledge. Aimé considers those who were furthest away from the achievements of scientific knowledge are human ancestors who first registered the uniqueness of the sunrise, the rain, the wind, and the moon, with emotion and imagination, as attaining a kind of precision unavailable through scientific knowledge. The desire for this more satisfying form of knowledge is what explains the move in the 19th century to claim special knowledge through poetry, as exemplified in Baudelaire, Rimbaud, and Mallarmé. This led in the 20th century to the achievements of Apollinaire, and finally Aimé's friend and admirer, Breton. Such poets approach the poem not with mere intelligence, but with their whole being. In so doing, they ultimately bring to bear all that has ever existed, for Aimé sees all true poetry as appealing to the unconscious, and the unconscious as containing within it our unity with all of nature. Thus, Aimé makes the rather mystical claim, at a very mysterious moment all great poetry, without ever renouncing its humanity, ceases to be strictly human and starts to become truly cosmic. He also compares logical laws to safety rails that poetry is able to reveal to us as limitations we can transcend. Clearly then, poetry and knowledge touches on the common necritude theme of different and complementary ways of knowing. Yet the word necritude appears nowhere in the essay, nor do we find here any reference to race. This shows us that necritude thought is at all times a reflection on the variety of human capacities, even if necritude thought generally explores this topic by focusing on how people of different races have supposedly cultivated different capacities to varying degrees. With the next year, 1945, began the unexpected and remarkable development of Hermes's political career. He accepted an invitation by local communists to run on their ticket in municipal and then French national elections, which resulted in him becoming the mayor of Fort de France, Martinique's capital, and a representative in the French National Assembly. The year after that, 1946, brought the momentous development of departmentalization. Aimé himself proposed to the National Assembly the law that would make the Caribbean island colonies of Martinique and Guadeloupe, plus French Guiana in South America, and the island of Réunion in the Indian Ocean, into constituent parts of the French Republic. The law gained unanimous consent. Now, this may seem deeply puzzling. As we're about to discuss, Aimé will shortly write what may be his most celebrated work of prose, and certainly the one that has been most available to readers of English, Discourse on Colonialism, a true classic of anti-colonial political thought. How could the author of this book strive not for independence from the colonizing power of France, but rather for closer ties to that power? Here we would once again recommend Gary Wilder's work on the political thought of Aimé and Senghor in the 1940s and 1950s. As he shows, Aimé's support for departmentalization may, first of all, be understood as a part of an effort to push forward the legacy of Scholcher's abolitionism. Both Aimé and Scholcher regarded legal emancipation as a catalyst for socioeconomic reorganization through integration rather than separation. Of course, lofty political ideals often run into the problem of disappointing political realities, and the implementation of this change in Martinique's status was troubled from the start. 
loopholes in the law meant that the extension of social benefits to the island was not automatic, hampering the socio-economic advancement that might otherwise have come from its being part of France. Though Aimé's frustration with his unfair process pushed him away from the initial goal of complete integration, his preferred solution was federalist autonomy rather than independence. He never did achieve this goal and ceased trying to change Martinique's legal status in the 1980s, partly because a policy of decentralization took hold during that time, making more room for regional difference. Thus, as a political actor seeking to do his best for Martinique, Aimé was forced to practice another art, the art of the possible, also known as politics. As a political philosopher, though, he had a more global scope and could be constrained only by his own sense of right and wrong. This is what makes Discourse on Colonialism such a powerful text. Writing in the wake of recent atrocities by French colonial authorities in Algeria, Vietnam, and Madagascar, the Discourse attacks colonialism as dehumanizing in the most uncompromising fashion possible. That process affects the peoples of colonizing countries, and not only those who are colonized. Aimé argues that colonization works to decivilize the colonizer, to brutalize him in the true sense of the word, to degrade him, to awaken him to buried instincts, to covetousness, violence, race hatred, and moral relativism. To accept that your country will kill and torture is, according to this argument, a deadening of the conscience, one that is bound to have catastrophic effects. For Aimé, this is not mere speculation, but a diagnosis of the most infamous atrocity of the 20th century. For a European to be shocked at what happened during the Second World War is, in his estimation, a matter of hypocrisy and self-deception, as Nazism was a matter of Europe inflicting upon itself what it had been inflicting upon others. Thus Aimé encourages us to reveal to the very distinguished, very humanistic, very Christian bourgeois of the 20th century that without his being aware of it, he has a Hitler inside him, that Hitler inhabits him, that Hitler is his demon, that if he rails against him, he is being inconsistent, and that at bottom what he cannot forgive Hitler for is not the crime in itself, the crime against man. It is not the humiliation of man as such, it is the crime against the white man, the humiliation of the white man, and the fact that he applied to Europe colonialist procedures which until then had been reserved exclusively for the Arabs of Algeria, the coolies of India, and the N-words of Africa. The discourse was first published in 1950, but then appeared in an expanded version in 1955, published by Présence Africaine, which also published the definitive edition of Aimé's Notebook of a Return to My Native Land. It is hard to overstate the importance of Présence Africaine for the development and dissemination of Africana thought in the 20th century. It was the name of a bilingual journal, publishing work in French and English, that first appeared in 1947, and also of a publishing house, which began its activities in 1949 by publishing Placide Temple's Bantu philosophy. The whole enterprise was the brainchild of Alioune Diop, a Senegalese intellectual who worked to connect black thinkers of different places and generations. It was Présence Africaine that organized the first Congress of Black Writers and Artists in Paris in 1956, followed by a similarly significant second Congress in Rome in 1959. The celebrated African-American writer, James Baldwin, who we'll be covering soon enough, attended the 1956 conference and made clear in an essay on his experience of the event that Aimé's presentation of his paper, Culture and Colonization, was the conference's greatest highlight. Baldwin writes, This speech, which was very brilliantly delivered, wrung from the audience which heard it the most violent reaction of joy. Césaire had spoken for those who could not speak, and those who could not speak thronged around the table to shake his hand and kiss him. Chike and I have given our fair share of conference papers and can confirm that this sort of rapturous reception is sadly pretty rare. It's all the more amazing given the stellar lineup of other speakers, including Franz Fanon, Richard Wright, Sheikh Anta Diop, William Fontaine, and Jean Price Mars. These other speakers also included Senghor, which gives us the perfect opportunity to consider how similar, or different, the two friends and proponents of negritude really were. It was at this event that Senghor offered the clarification of his earlier statement that emotion is Negro as reason is Hellenic, by distinguishing between intuitive and analytical reason, as discussed in our previous episode. Where he presented himself as addressing the physio-psychology of the Negro, 
Emma's paper begins by raising the question of what the conference's attendees, in all their diversity, share with one another. His immediate answer is, the common denominator is the colonial situation. The contrast seems to speak for itself. Senghor starts with racial essentialism, Césaire with the political condition of having been colonized. Yet Aimé goes on to argue that there is a double solidarity connecting the attendees, as there is both the horizontal solidarity involved in sharing the common condition of being in a colonial situation, something that he says is true even of African Americans in a way, but also the vertical solidarity involved in sharing a common origin. He does not deny that the black people at the conference represent a diversity of cultures, but he does argue that cultures can be grouped by their affinities into families or civilizations. Just as we can speak of French, Italian, and German cultures belonging to a larger European civilization, the black solidarity shown at the conference, insofar as it is vertical, comes from the fact that out of an initial unity, the unity of African civilization, there has been differentiated a whole series of cultures that all owe something to that civilization. So he is as willing as Senghor to speak of African civilization as a kind of unity, to which all the cultures of the diaspora owe something. But don't break out the flowers and chocolates just yet, because there is also a stark contrast between the two thinkers. It seems likely Aimé was actively trying to criticize his friend at this conference, and also some years before, in the discourse, even while not mentioning him by name. In a 1945 essay entitled Views on Black Africa, or Assimilate Rather Than Be Assimilated, Senghor discusses the question of how France should understand its colonial relationship with Africa. He recounts a white friend saying to him, Admit finally that we brought you civilization. Senghor responded, Not exactly. You brought us your civilization. Let us take from it what is best and most fruitful in it, and allow us to give you back the rest. Following this exchange, he argues that the best way to see the problem of colonialism is to understand it as a matter of the contact between two civilizations. In the discourse, Aimé writes, I admit that it is a good thing to place different civilizations in contact with each other, that it is an excellent thing to blend different worlds. But then he raises the question, has colonization really placed civilizations in contact? His answer is no, and in Culture and Colonization, he defends this position at length, contending that, wherever there has been colonization, entire peoples have been emptied of their culture, of all culture. Crucial to his argument is the claim that what is most important to the existence of culture is the faculty of self-renewal, that is, the power of culture to evolve on its own accord, to go beyond what it has been thus far through self-propelled innovation. This is what the fact of being ruled by a colonial power must by necessity destroy, meaning that colonialization by necessity robs colonized peoples of their cultures. Aimé stands firm on this throughout the speech, answering various objections. Does the colonizer rob the colonized of their culture, but then substitute the colonizer's culture? No, as that would mean providing the colonized with the means to be exactly equal, rather than retaining them in an exploited position of subordination. What about the idea that colonization makes possible a new culture, that mixes those of the colonizer and the colonized? Aimé replies that cultural borrowing is only valid when it is done actively on the basis of an internal need, while the colonial situation is quite the opposite. Elements of the colonizer's culture are imposed and remain juxtaposed with elements of the culture of the colonized, rather than harmonized into an integrated whole. Thus, colonialism is at all times incompatible with the healthy existence of a culture on the part of the colonized. As we have said, while not explicitly aimed at Senghor's framing of the problem of colonialism, this seems a clear rebuke from one great negritude thinker to another. Yet, Aimé seems to come back closer to Senghor's position as he brings his paper to a close. The role of black men of culture, such as those in attendance at the Congress, he claims, is to prepare a way forward toward cultures of the future. He vehemently opposes the idea that these future cultures might be completely disconnected from the traditional ones that were interrupted by colonialism. While still not naming Senghor, he makes this point in very Senghorian terms. I believe that the civilization that has given Negro sculpture to the world of art, that the civilization that has given to the political and social world original communitarian institutions, such as village democracy or age group fraternities or familiar property, that negation of capitalism, 
or so many institutions bearing the stamp of the spirit of solidarity, that this civilization that on another level has given to the moral world an original philosophy based on respect for life and integration within the cosmos, I refuse to believe that this civilization, insufficient though it may be, must be annihilated or denied as a precondition of the renaissance of black peoples. Happily, then, we can end our discussion of the contributions of the negritude thinkers to this historic conference on a note of amity, two lifelong friends whose lives were so enriched by the bond they created as students in Paris in the 1930s, still speaking together with one voice. Having discussed this conference at length, we can only briefly touch on Aimé's other monumental prose work of 1956, the Letter to Maurice Thorez. A number of things inspired him to break with the Communist Party, including his identity as a poet, as he bristled at attempts by the French poet Louis Aragon to say what good communist poets should or should not do, stylistically. He does not mention this factor in the letter, beginning instead with the factor that is likely to make the most sense to those of us looking back, namely his disappointment with the French Communist Party's failure to interrogate its values in the wake of revelations from the Soviet Union concerning the terrors of Stalinism. The letter is famous, however, and was printed by Frosens Afrikan because Aimé expresses his conclusion that activism on behalf of black people, and the people of Martinique in particular, cannot be productively pursued through the Communist Party. The struggle of the colonized against colonialism and people of color against racism is different from the struggle of the French worker in ways that require independent organizing. Perhaps the most famous lines of the letter come in response to the anticipated objection that he is choosing to be provincial rather than remain committed to a universal struggle. Aimé writes, Not at all. I am not burying myself in a narrow particularism, but neither do I want to lose myself in an emaciated universalism. My conception of the universal is that of a universal enriched by all that is particular, a universal enriched by every particular, the deepening and coexistence of all particulars. This is a fitting statement with which to sum up the philosophical perspective of the Negritude movement as a whole. Next time, we'll be seeing a very different perspective on race and economics. Our subject will be the sociologist E. Franklin Fraser, who spoke out on those issues and also reacted to the Harlem Renaissance, albeit in a very different and far more critical way than the founders of Negritude we have discussed over the last three episodes. That will be our next love letter addressed to the history of Africana philosophy.